I'd like to have you take your Bibles, please, and join with me in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. And I like today talk about something that I think is very important, and it's going to be called something like holiday cleanup. Holiday cleanup. We're coming upon Easter season, although for me, I prefer to call it Resurrection Sunday. I think the term Easter has taken away from the glory of the day. I think it is all about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so through the years I've been trying to uh, pass that on to people, it is Resurrection Sunday. And it's a day that we honor the, and glorify the living Lord Jesus Christ. And so I wonder, are you ready for the holiday? That is Resurrection Sunday. Are you ready for Good Friday and all the things that accompany that? I think for the believer, for those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, that should be, and I don't know how any other way to put it, but that should be our high holy day, Resurrection Sunday. Join with me, please, in Isaiah chapter 1. Follow along, please, in your Bible. I'm reading out of the King James this morning, and I hope that you can make the appropriate uh, translation as we come that way. Beginning with verse 1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. The Lord continues through the prophet, Ah, sinful nation! A people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They have gone away backward. Why should you be stricken anymore? Will you revolt more and more? And then he says of the nation, the whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there's no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and purify, putrefying swords, sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Of that nation, Judah, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land... Uh, and fire, your land, the strangers devour it in your presence. It is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in the vineyard, as a lodge in the garden of cucumbers. It is besieged, it is as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts have left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. What, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of the fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, nor of lambs, nor of he goats. And when you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread upon my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbath, the solemn calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is an iniquity, even the solemn meetings. Verse 14, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth, the Lord said. They are a tr tr trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. 
judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Verse 18, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, ye shall eat of the good of the land. And then here in verse 20, but if you refuse or rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. And I beg of you, would you bow together with me as we pray? We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless, I pray, our time together. I thank you, Father, for the ministry of Abundant Life Baptist Church. And Father, I thank you for even what I heard today as far as the, the uh, weight of praying and pleading with you for a pastor. And Father, there's nothing too hard for you. You said you can do the impossible. And so I continue to plead and beg of you with these folks here that you would provide the man of your choice to lead this flock to shepherd these sheep. And Father, so that this pastor and people and the ministry of Abundant Life Baptist Church may be a steadfast witness and lighthouse in this, in this community for your namesake. I do thank you, Father, for the freedom that we have this morning to declare your word. I am asking that you allow your word to fall upon receptive hearts and lives today. Father, we approach a very important time of the calendar year for the believer, where we focus upon the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, as this church makes plans to reach out into the community with the Easter egg hunt and those kind of things, I pray, Father, that we would again remember what you did for us. And I thank you, Father, that you so loved us that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. And my prayer again is, if there's anyone here today that may not know Jesus, I pray, Father, that you would soften their heart by the ministry of your word and through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And may they today call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Thank you again for your goodness. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Have you been in the grocery store or one of those big box stores and you hear over the loudspeaker system, clean up in aisle six or something like that? I can remember at many of those kind of occasions and you just out of curiosity turn around the corner to aisle six and you see a mess has been made and all the people in the store hopefully are making a mad rush to clean up things in aisle six or wherever it is. Remember my family and I went to an amusement park in Virginia and uh, I wanted a coffee. And so I went to a stand and I, admir I admired the bottles of those things that they had in the back, those syrups that you put into coffee to make all those luscious drinks. And this guy took down this bottle and he was showing me this bottle that came from Italy. And he said to me, and these are very expensive when we got the best to put into our coffee. And then the bottle slipped out of his hand and fell onto the floor. I didn't know who to blame, him or me. But can you imagine the mess of a stickiness that he had to clean up? I want to just take that kind of silly illustration this morning and think about our houses. Think about, as a pastor, I've been in all kinds of homes. At college, I was on a uh, outreach team and, uh, boy, a gospel team, and I've been in some homes, asked to sleep into some homes, and I saw some different homes that way. Uh, I've been on missions trips, and I've been in different homes that way. And likewise, as our church, as I came to our church up in Pittsburgh for a bit to get support to go to that church, I was, what they call, I was on what they call deputation. And then again, in that process, stayed in many homes. And as pastor, boy, I've seen many homes that way. And boy, I've seen all sorts of things 
that uh, uh, living conditions, if I could put it that way. I, I was in a home when I was pastoring in Pittsburgh, and honestly, you entered at home and there was no place to sit. And a lady said to me even this way, she said, listen, you, if you want to have a seat, you may have to remove that bundle of stuff there and put it elsewhere. And there underneath somewhere was a seat, uh, place to sit myself. But uh, I'm saying that to say sometimes our homes are not what they ought to be. Just yesterday, we had somebody come out and give us a bid for storm doors, and my wife scurried about, not that we're in that kind of condition, but my wife scurried about to make sure that whatever the man saw, we had at least a clean house. Problem is, we have two dogs at shed, and there's like little clouds all over the floor that we had to quickly pick up. Well, I say that to remind you that the Lord Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, lives within each and every one of us as true believers, his indwelling presence. And can you imagine, many times the Holy Spirit lives in squalored conditions. I mean, like many homes, the Christian can look good on the outside, righteous on the outside, say all the right things, but generally within, they need to be cleaned up. They are filthy. Today, I want to address that. And I want to as well address the squalored conditions that the Holy Spirit, Jesus, through that ministry of the Holy Spirit, may be living within you. And perhaps, can you imagine if, if we could that way, using that illustration of how he lives and where he lives within us, can you imagine as well, due to the filthiness within us, what kind of stench he smells? Have you ever gone into a house and it smells terrible? Somebody forgot to change the kitty litter. That kind of smell. I wonder what kind of a smell does the Lord have if we can think through that way as he abides within each and every one of us. Easter is coming, or should I say again, Resurrection Day is coming. And did you know that Good Friday, our Good Friday, roughly corresponds with the Jewish Passover? Read the scriptures. Roughly the same time, same amount of days. And I don't know if you know what some of the Orthodox Jews do during Passover. See, they have this as a mindset. The mindset is prior to Passover and proper preparation, they do what is called a Passover cleaning. And their objective is to get rid of every bit of crumb in their house. Now think with me, where can crumbs be found? Think with me, you probably have crumbs. I mean, when I take my grandkids somewhere, I'm bound to be finding crumbs in the back seats. I mean, they're all over the place. But this is a religious endeavor to make sure because crumbs to them represent leaven. Leaven to them, according to the scriptures, represents sin. So to get ready for the Passover, they got to get rid of the leaven, a picture to get ready for Passover, they have to get rid of sin. In Israel, for example, during Passover, you will find in the middle of the streets little bonfires. They'll bring out everything out of the house and to make sure that they are thoroughly cleansed from the crumbs or the leaven, again, as it represents sin. With that all in mind, I just want to remind you that that's what the Lord is doing in this passage. No doubt as we read through it, you understood, boy, the Lord is being harsh. Let me give you a little bit of a context. It says early in the passage, verse 1, Isaiah the prophet being used of the Lord to minister to the kings of, Jew, of, the, uh, of Judah. And note Judah, part of Judah would have been Jerusalem at this time. Assyria was in ascendancy. Assyria was the Russia or red China of its day. And Assyria wanted to take over nation after nation after nation. Judah's brother, Samaria, north, 
was already taken over by Assyria. Now they were on their way to Jerusalem and Judea and Judah itself, and they were taking it over. In fact, when this was being written, Assyria was taking over various cities, and soon at the end of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 37, 38, 39, they were getting ready to go into Jerusalem. That was the last stronghold. Taking over Jerusalem, it would have been the defeat of Judah. Isaiah is warning them as to why God was doing this. And if you read through the book of Isaiah, you have heard perhaps many times, Isaiah 1 through 39 represents the Old Testament where many judgments are going to fall upon Judah unless they get their act together. From chapter 40 to the end of the chapter, 66 chapters, 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, the end of Isaiah, 40 through the end, it begins with these words. Even though God was going to bring judgment, it begins with these words. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith the Lord. Why did they need to have the cleanup? We want to explore that today. And then in exploring that today, I want to challenge you to make it personal, perhaps you within. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, that abiding presence of his spirit, perhaps you might as well need to clean up. Note here, as we look work through the passage, in verse 10, we, we need to clean up several points here when our action reminds God of Sodom and Gomorrah. Note the words of verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. It's to Judah that he's writing to, but he likens them to Sodom and Gomorrah. Note, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah, what is he saying there? Our actions, we need clean up when our actions remind God that we are much like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know a little bit about Sodom and Gomorrah. Look with me at verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts have left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. In other words, there was very few left. God was going to wipe them off the face of the map in a sense, but he says, since there's just a few remnant here, I'm going to spare you. But you're much, but understand, like Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, you deserve that same kind of destruction. God's people deserve that same kind of destruction. Well, how were they like Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, you might think they were heavily involved with homosexuality. Our country's heavily involved in homosexuality. A sin, and I can remember reading in seminary textbook after textbook after textbook saying how homosexuality was abnormal behavior. What have we done? But there's more ways to be much like Sodom and Gomorrah other than homosexuality. Let me read to you a verse from the book of Ezekiel. It says, As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters as thou hast done. Thou and thy daughters, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride. This was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride. The Lord continues, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed them and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Isn't it very interesting? Not only the sin of homosexuality, but pride. Gay pride. We continue here. And again, as I work through this for you in a moment, uh, we think for a moment, I'm not like them, but are we proud? Are we too proud to think at times when we're wrong and admit it? Are we too proud to forgive at times? Are we too proud to come to God for help? 
Are we too proud to be submissive to God and do things His way, the Bible's way? And what about the fullness of bread there, as we read from Ezekiel? How about this? Are we overfed when others are starving? Do we overeat? Or, as that verse said out of Ezekiel, are we idle when God has for us things to do? Are we idle when there's people in our community that do not know the gospel? Are we idle in our zeal and love for God? What I'm saying through all that, even as a church, do we neglect the physical and spiritual poor and needy around us when we are proud when we're full and tend to be lazy. Sodom was guilty of wicked abominations, no doubt. But although we may not have time for homosexuality because of what God's Word says, how many of us have drifted online to allow sexual fantasies, pornography, adultery, or some other abomination to control you? We need God's cleanup when we remind God that we're much like Sodom and Gomorrah, the sin of pride, the sin of laziness, the sin of abundance without helping others. Secondly, looking at the text in front of you, note with me in the words of verse 11. The Lord through the prophet Isaiah says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Saith the Lord, I'm full of the burnt offerings of the rams. I had enough of it. And of the fat of fed beast, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. Second point, we need cleanup when there are too many sacrifices that we offer to God, but God is fed up. What do we mean by that? You see here in verse 11, God was fed up with the sacrifices of people. But wait a minute, didn't God institute the sacrificial system? Didn't he as well, by the institution of that, picture many years down the road, the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross? What we're saying here in verse 11 is this, God was fed up with the sacrifices because they no longer meant anything to the people. The people were going through the motions of sacrificing and they were being hypocrites. They offered their sacrifices and worshiped God. On the other hand, they were full of iniquity. It didn't mean a thing to them. In another verse out of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 29, it says, verse 13, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as its people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips they do honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of man. Therefore the Lord continues, Behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for it's the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and your understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. What we are saying is, do we need a cleanup when we're hypocrites in our worship before God? Can I ask you a question? We sang some tremendous hymns this morning, but where was your heart during worship? Was it focused upon the Lord? How about this? Where's your heart right now? Are you focused on God? or maybe something else that pleases you. That's why the hymn writer wrote these words. And it's sobering words to me, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. I wonder, have you thought through all what worship is to God? Are you willing to put it, the mouth it, into motion, but it's far from the heart. We need a cleanup when we're hypocrites in our worship and understand in the words of verse 11, God is fed up with us. Notice we, as we continue in verse 12, we need a cleanup when there's frequent attendance, but it's a God 
who is indifferent. Note the words of verse 12. I read this. When you come to appear before me, the Lord says, who hath required this at your hand to tread in my courts? God, you see, understand that, uh, that God considers worship a pleasure to him. But God saw them as a worship as trampling in his courts. Latter part of verse 12. That is this. Does God become weary of your presence simply because your heart is not right with him? Does God become weary of your presence because you really don't want to be here and you really don't care? God says, listen, who required you to come in the first place? If your heart is not in it, don't do it, is what the words of verse 12 is saying. So, again, we need cleanup when there's frequent attendance, but God is indifferent. Continuing, verse 13 and 14, we need cleanup when there's many attempts at worship, but it's a God who is grieved. 13 and 14, I read again, bring no more vain oblations. That was going through their sacrificial systems. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. In other words, do away with them. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting, verse 14. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to hear them, or to bear them, I should say. We need clean up when there's many attempts of worship, but God is grieved. God ordained for his people to go through many days of worship, feasts. And he did so, so that they would be constantly reminded as, as to what he had done for them. But now, verse 13 and 14, he wants nothing to do with them. Why? Because their heart is not in it. Their heart condition and sinful behavior of the people. In a sense, have you ever stopped what God, have you ever stopped to consider what God thinks of our Resurrection Sunday worship? Have you ever stopped to consider what God thinks of our Good Friday time or whenever you, you observe the Lord's death upon the cross? Again, I think it should be one of our biggest, if I could say it that way, holidays of the year. But how much do we understand what Jesus Christ did for us? Much worship, I believe, we give to God actually grieves him because our hearts of the worshiper, our hearts are not right. Think about it. Good Friday, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And yet we go through it, kind of putting it in neutral, not affecting us again. Resurrection Sunday. He lives! Paul says those two things. I preached unto you the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet we busy ourselves with Easter eggs, those kind of things. I'm not saying there's not a place for them. What I am saying, this is a momentous event and it should reflect in our worship for God and what he has done for us. We need cleanup when there's attempts at worship, but God continues to be grieved. Continuing, number five, verse 15, we need cleanup when there's many prayers but a God that will not hear. Note in the words of verse 5 and when, uh, 15, and when you spread forth your hands, that is holding out your hands as their tradition was, I will hide, uh, holding out their hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. When you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. My mother, bless her soul, whatever that means, the self. But my mom used to require, and I never understood why, that before coming to the table, I needed to wash my hands. Did you catch that? Wash. Boy, that slips in every once in a while. Wash my hands. 
And if one of the things that she would ask prior to serving, did you wash your hands? Folks, as we come to pray in a spiritual sense, did we wash our hands? As, the, as it says there in verse 15, they prayed many prayers, but their hands were full of blood. Why and when does God not hear our prayers? Isaiah 59 says it this way, Behold, the, hand, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save Neither is his head, ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath suffered, muttered perverseness. None calls for justice, none pleads for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. You see, God, children of Israel, Judah, had bloody hands. And God says, as a result, I will not listen to you. Now, understand, it does not necessarily meant that they killed someone, but some of their actions brought forth the same kind of results. And likewise, may we understand, we don't need to kill someone to have bloody hands. Matthew 5 says it this way. Uh, uh, it says that we need to make sure that we live peacefully with all men. Hebrews amplifies that. Listen to that. Hebrews 12. Follow peace with all men and holiness, for without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God. Then he says to the church there, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Maybe something as you continue to pray for a pastor. Are you sure that as a church your hands are not bl bloodied? Are you sure as a church there's not a root of bitterness springing up, troubling you, and thereby many be defiled? Let me be a little bit more specific here. If you're angry with a brother and sister without cause, the Bible says you're guilty of equivalence of murder. If you commit character assassination, you are displeasing to God. If you gossip, you're sown discord among the brethren. If you hold a grudge, a root of bitterness against someone that you're failing to apply the grace of God to your life. That God, this grudge will trouble you and those around you a root of bitterness. And let me tell you something else. Churches are usually hurting big time because of those within holding grudges one against the, uh, uh, the other. And as a pastor, I want to tell you that sometimes those grudges go on for years. You need cleanup when there's many prayers, but God will not listen or hear your prayer. Now, fortunately, the text gives us the solution out of the problem. We can have cleanup. Note as we continue through the past passage, we can have cleanup when, note with me, verse 16, when we heed God's call to repentance. In the words of verse 16, he says, this is the way out. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil from your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. We can have cleanup when we heed God's call to repentance. Note there, you've heard it many times, no doubt. A, confess, that's the words in verse 16. Wash you and make you clean. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we what? Confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. And dear Christian, and to cleanse us 
from all wash uh, under righteousness. Have you confessed your sin? You know what confession is? It's not saying as Adam, that woman that you gave me, she's the problem. No, it's not that. It's saying as David, against thee and thee alone have I sinned. In the words of Proverbs, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Note, confess. We can have clean up when we get right with God. Second thing, forsake. It says in verse 16, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Forsake it. Forsake your evil doing. Understand, of course we're to forsake, but we also must need to put away the evil in our doings from before God's eyes. You see, it means that we get right with one another, no doubt, but we get right to God. And folks, in a church, did you know that there's times that we must need to confess our sins to one another? And likewise, there are times within a local church that we need to seek forgiveness of one another. Matthew chapter 5, the Lord says, before you do anything as far as offering a sacrifice, in the words of Matthew 5, bringing your gift, it says this, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer thy gift. Many times I think the Lord does not do a work within the church because we refuse to get right with one another. Years ago, I can remember this to this day, I said something to an off, in an off-handed way to a deacon in our church. And I'm sitting up there and I'm thinking, oh, I should not have said that. Oh, why did I say that? You've had those moments, no doubt. And then, wouldn't you know, that service was the communion service. And during the hymn, I had to sneak back. How do you do that in the church? To that deacon and say, Larry, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I wonder, have you ever done that to one another here within the church? We can have cleanup when we confess. We can have cleanup when we forsake and get right with God. And then three, we can have cleanup when we learn. Note the words of verse 17. Learn to do well. We must also learn to do well. If we don't learn to do well, in the words of verse 17, we'll just repeat our sins over and over and over again, and we'll hurt others within the church, or whatever that way. Learn to do well. And then the passage, verse 17, likewise, we're to as well seek justice, do what is right and fair to all. In the words of verse 17, I'm to relieve those who are physically and spiritually oppressed. Come alongside of somebody within the church. Encourage them. In the words of verse 17, I'm to seek the well-being of the fatherless and widow. Those that are down and out are not to be exploited, but helped. So we can have cleanup when we confess, forsake, learn to do well, but as well, we can have cleanup when we accept God's invitation for the cleansing. Note what he offers to this people. After the litany of all the awful things, you're rotten to the core, the very first part of the chapter. And then he cites everything that they did against God. Notice his offering to them. Verse 18, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We continue, if you are willing and obedient, that is to do, confess, forsake, learn, and get rid of those sins, if you be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Verse 20, but if you refuse and rebel, Ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. I like that. 
Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Perhaps deep down inside, the Lord may be saying that to you. Let's just talk about it. Come now and reason together and understand this. Though your sins be as scarlet, though you have done sins against me, in the words of this text, though they are gross iniquity, the Lord says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. What the Lord is saying is, come to court with me. He said, why are you trampling on my courts? Now he's saying, come to court with me. Let us reason together. What he implies there is that we are to repent and do as he said, as we just went through in verses 16 and 17. And God says here, though your sins be as scarlet, that is a red dye made from worms in the day, he would make them white as snow. He also said there be sins as though they may be like crimson, that would be a red colored cloth, he would make them white as wool. It's a miracle. There was a room in our church, somebody years ago to make it kid kind of interesting, put a stripe of red in the room. We painted over that and painted over that and painted over it and the red still bled through. And by the way, we use kilts that's supposed to eliminate that. And the red still bled through. What I'm saying is this, the Lord can do the impossible. Though your sins be as scarlet, though they be red, he is in the business, a miracle working business of taking our sins, filthy sins, and making us totally clean. How can he make such a promise? We remember the holiday, Good Friday. God sent his son, and there upon the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ washed the way with his blood our filthy sins. And God can forgive us now because he was satisfied with the perfect work of his son to pay for our sins. The Bible says, and such were some of you, but now you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So this morning, do you need to clean up? Both individually and perhaps again, as the Lord prompts your heart, maybe even as a church, do you need to clean up? And are you willing to be cleaned up? In the text here, are you willing to be cleansed? Are you willing to be obedient to confess, forsake, and make things right with God, and make things right with others? Are you willing to be obedient? Are you willing to go forward with the Lord in order to prosper spiritually? And by prospering spiritually, I mean come to that place where you're able to worship God in a worship that God will accept and be pleased with. If you're not willing to repent, you're not willing to let God cleanse you, I believe like Judah, Israel of old, we will suffer the consequences. So in the review, our actions, we need cleanup when we remind God of Sodom and Gomorrah, not just the homosexuality and the perverseness, but the pride of our hearts. We need clean up when there's many attempts of sacrifices, but God is simply fed up. We need clean up when there's frequent going to worship and attendance, but it's God who is indifferent. We need clean up when there's many attempts at worship, but it's God who is grieved. We need clean up when there's many, many prayers, but our life indicates that God will not hear. And thanks be to God, we can have clean up when we heed God's call to repentance and when we accept God's invitation for a cleansing. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Heavenly Father, clean up. Father, as I mentioned at the beginning, inwardly, I wonder if our 
inward being represents residence where the Holy Spirit lives in squalor. We have his abiding presence, but no doubt along the way, we squelched any inward working that he may have because our lives are not right with you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that for each one in this room, myself and others, that we would come to that place as God simply just fed up with us and we need a personal within cleanup. Take the words of Scripture today, we plead, and allow the Holy Spirit to grip our hearts and lives. Father, this church is a precious church. It needs a shepherd. And perhaps only you know, Heavenly Father, but perhaps it needs a thorough cleaning before a shepherd can come. Father, we just pray that you do a work that way. Whatever this church needs, we pray that you would allow both people and leaders to respond in a way that would bring honor and glory to you. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.